Hi, welcome to a new episode, in the Internet Surfer, hosting the most horror, and creepiest stories, from Reddit. Please, don't forget, to comment, like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy. Serious. Creepypasta are great, but does anyone have any good true creepy stories? Horror Stories from Ascredit, Creepypasta. Episode 7. I work in a call center. About two weeks ago I got a man on the phone looking for an address related to the business. The first thing he tells me is that he was born blind, something that went wrong during his birth, but that he was psychic. I proceeded to roll my eyes and went on with the call. We chatted a bit, and he talked a bit more about some random things, and then he said, I'm a Gemini. Are you a Gemini? Indulging him, I said, nope, I'm a Libra, which is true. Then he said, oh silly me, of course. Your birthday is the 10th of October. That's on a Friday this year you know. The 10th of October is indeed my birthday. I didn't say a thing for about 10 seconds. He only knew my first name and that I'm a Libra. This was about two minutes into the call. I struggled with wanting to hang up on him or ask him more questions about my future. I was pretty freaked out. When my son was a baby, from newborn to eight months old, we lived in a small apartment in an old building. He must have been about seven months old or so when this happened. In the past year we had lived there, I had woken up to the sight of a human-shaped transparent white thing, standing at the end of the bed, and then it would drift away toward the wall as soon as it realized I was awake. I assume. All these times I see it, I don't want to make a big deal because pregnant women are crazy and have crazy dreams, etc. Same with sleep-deprived new parents. Until one night, I wake up to my son cooing, and he's pointing at the white figure. He and I both clearly saw it, though of course he couldn't say anything. That's when I was fairly sure I wasn't just seeing things. When we moved to a different apartment in the same building soon after that, there was a leak that needed to be fixed, I suddenly found that I was no longer afraid of using the bathroom in the dark. In the apartment with the white figure, the bathroom mirror gave me that heart-racing scared-of-the-dark feeling, and I just assumed I was afraid of mirrors in the dark in general. But when we moved, there were no problems with that. Also, no more figure watching us sleep. My son freaking loves this story now. He wishes he could remember it. About five years ago, I was living in a different city with my ex. One night, we had just pulled up to our house and were sitting in the driveway, just talking before going inside. While sitting there, we both heard these footsteps pounding on the road right behind us. They seemed to come from nowhere like someone dropped from the sky and started running. They didn't start from extremely far away, just directly on the road behind us. I know we both heard it because we both jumped and looked in that direction. I thought someone was robbing us or hijacking our vehicle. Just as the footsteps get to the driver's side of our vehicle, the sound stops and a black mass float past the car window and into our house or around it. I started to freak out. I had questions about what just happened. My ex is looking surprised but more chill than I. I asked him to explain to me WTF just happened. He is a doctor, so I was looking for him to confirm the experience, telling me I didn't imagine it. He says, just ignore it. Then we went inside, and I was freaking, looking in every corner, feeling like something was going to be lurking there. My ex went around the house, to every window, saying something in Arabic. Then he told me again to just ignore it if anything else happens. Just ignore it. How? It was so puzzling and scary. The next day we went to a really, really shady psychic lady, well two of them, sisters. Their house was creepy, the ceilings were cracked all the way across. Their setup was questionable, they needed to meet us and then have us come back a day later and have our readings. They told us a bunch of stuff that could have easily come from an internet search. I asked them about the black thing, 
and they said my ex's ex-wife had put a curse on him and anyone who comes into his life. At this point, they offered to remove it, and my ex said no thanks, gave them money and left. Fast forward several years, we married, many sad things happened, and we separated. At the same time, we separated, my father's heart stopped suddenly while he was driving. Through fortunate circumstances, he survived, only to learn there's nothing wrong with him and no explanation for his cardiac arrest. At the same time, my extremely healthy brother was diagnosed with progressive MS. I was diagnosed with several conditions that are not typical for someone my age. Last year it occurred to me, if there's any possibility this curse thing is true, it could be harming people around me. I didn't necessarily believe it, but decided it was worth exploring. So, I went to a spiritual medium my friends visit regularly. She is truly angelic. It's a weird feeling for me as I'm not that spiritual or religious at all. I told her about the black thing and how my ex's ex-wife cursed us. She stopped me right away. She said, oh no, no. It wasn't her who cursed you. It was him. I work the 3 to 11 shift at a seasonally driven hotel. In the off season, October May, we go from two people at the front desk each shift to one person. I'm the supervisor, so I get stuck alone a lot. Last February ish, on a Monday, around 10 pm, the phone rang. I answer with my usual hotel story, thank you for calling the Bubbity Duabity, summer child speaking, how can I help you? On the other end of the line was an Asian guy whose English was awful. He paused for a second before asking me something in Chinese, Korean, Japanese. I'm sorry sir I only speak English, I can transfer you to reservations, they have translators. Click. Man hangs up on me. Now my shift ends in an hour. I have a system down, where I do all my closing reports, count my bank, all that stuff to get ready to get out of there. In the middle of counting my bank, the phone rang again. Thank you for calling the Bubbity Duabity, summer child speaking, how can I help you? It was the same Asian guy. At this point I'm a little annoyed, and I transfer him straight to reservations so they can find someone who understands what he wants. Not five seconds after I transferred him, the phone rang again. It's the Asian guy only this time, in very broken English, he asks to talk to Cho. I don't have a Cho who works here, is he a guest with us? The Asian guy is talking amazingly fast to someone in the background when a younger guy gets on the phone. I'm very sorry to bother you but my father is confused, who am I speaking to? I'm getting more annoyed by the second, is it time for me to go yet? This is the Bubbity Duabity and my name is Summerchild, who are you guys trying to reach? The son doesn't say anything for a second, then I hear him speaking to his dad in the background. After a few seconds of loud, what sounds like, arguing, the son comes back, apologizes for bothering me, and hangs up. Phone rings again. It's the song. Look ma'am I'm really sorry but I'm not trying to call you, we have been trying to call my dad's best friend Cho all night. He's had the same phone number for years and we have never had a problem. Only the past couple of times it reroutes us to you. I tell him what my phone number is, and he tells me the number he's trying to dial. I recognize it as a cell phone number from my state, but it shouldn't reroute to my hotel. I get the son's number, tell him I'll try dialing Cho's number, and I'll let him know. Dial up Mr. Cho, and instead of going to voicemail, it takes me to my hotel's extension options, where if you hit zero you'll ring the front desk. Okay, this is getting weird. I called the kid back and told him my findings. The Asian family is in a panic when the son tells me the reason they need to get a hold of Cho. Look ma'am I don't mean to freak you out, but Cho was fired from his job yesterday and he's been acting very strange ever since. This morning, he texted my dad basically a suicide notes, thanking him for being such a good friend, asking him to look out for his wife and daughter, and that he hopes they meet again one day. Cho hasn't answered any calls since then. We talked to his daughter a few hours ago and she says he hasn't been homing all day, 
and their handgun and rifle are both missing. Is there any way you can look up to see if he's staying there or maybe you know something? At this point I'm freaking out. It's dead quiet in the hotel, I have maybe 10 rooms in the house. It's just me and the Mexican housekeeper there. I know that we haven't had an Asian gentleman check in with us in over a week, and I checked in almost everyone who came in that day, I know there is no Mr. Cho at my hotel. I apologize profusely and explain we have no Asians, the best thing to do would be to contact his local police and report a missing person, and maybe call my town's police and report it to them too. I say if I find anything out I'll call them. They thanked me and we disconnected. It's 10.45 and it's creepy at the hotel. Is it possible someone checked in for him? Are the housekeepers going to walk into a dead Chinese guy in the morning? The overnight guy comes in and I don't tell him anything. He's already paranoid and weird to begin with, telling him would make things worse. I go home and dream about suicidal Asians. Fast forward three days and a body of an unidentified Asian man is found in the bay about two blocks from my hotel. He had a gunshot wound to his head. Later that day he is identified by a family friend as Mr. Cho. Maybe not scary or supernatural, but definitely the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me. Not me, but my brother. He was about 13 at the time if I remember correctly. My family loved to go camping. It was one of those times that we were at our favorite camping site right next to the lake. Perfect view and perfect weather. It being such perfect weather the grown-ups decided to take us kids for a quick swim. So, we were all laughing and splashing having fun when my brother stepped on something. Now the water wasn't clear by any means, but he said it felt like some kid's foot. My brother then eagerly waits for the person to pop up from underwater to apologize for stepping on them. My brother then waits for what he said felt like a minute or so. Being the kid he was, he just thought they could hold their breath for a really long time and went about his day and kept playing. Before we knew it, it was time to leave and head back to camp. Fast forward to that evening when we were all enjoying our hot dogs around the fire when a park ranger came up to our camp and asked to have a word with my father. Turned out that two boys had gone swimming earlier that day without supervision of anyone and drowned and the park ranger was trying to find their parents. One of my mom's friends bought an old farmhouse about a year back. They have a three-year-old son. The kid had an imaginary friend named Kevin. He would play with his toys in his room and talk to Kevin. His parents didn't really think anything of it considering the age of the kid. It got weird after they started listening to their son's conversations with Kevin over the baby monitor. It seemed like something a three-year-old wouldn't regularly talk about. The kid was kind of silly, so they didn't think much of it. They asked the kid about Kevin. He said Kevin is nice. He is a farmer. They figured that was because this kid loved to play with toy tractors, and they had just moved into a farmhouse. Then it got real. There was a shelf mounted on the wall of the kid's room that was about five feet off of the floor opposite of the bed. One morning, the parents go into the kid's room to find one of the stuffed animals that was on the shelf on the kid's bed. They asked him how he got the rabbit. The kid said that Kevin got it for him. A few months pass and stuff like this happens every now and again. Nothing that couldn't be reasonably explained. Since they moved in, they had found a church in the area and got involved in a Bible study with a few other couples from their church. They decided that they would host the Bible study one day. When they were setting everything up, they gave their address to one of the couples that had lived in town for a while. When they gave their address to the older couple, the wife looked at it and said to her husband, Hey, isn't this Kevin's old place? Apparently a man named Kevin used to live there. He ran into some financial troubles. He sold most of his land to the neighboring farm but kept the small patch of land that the house was on. He suffered from depression and had a bit of a drinking problem and eventually hung himself in the house. 
Their friend from church knew Kevin as it's a small town in Iowa and everyone knows everyone. He found a picture of Kevin and gave it to my mom's friend. The picture was of Kevin and three other guys that Kevin would meet with to have coffee and shoot stuff about farming. They showed the picture to the kid, and the kid pointed at Kevin and said, Hey look, it's Kevin. They moved. My mother told me this story when I was younger, don't remember all the details but I'll try. When she was a young adult, she lived in Texas for a couple of years. In the area where she lived, there was supposedly a lot of occult activity. Apparently the public schools would close on the occult holidays because that's when children were frequently abducted. Anyhow, a couple of her friends were talking about a supposed occult ritual area. She thought they were blowing steam, so she asked them to show her. They drove out to a long, dirt road surrounded by crop fields. It was a road that she drove down frequently on her commute to work. But it was nighttime, and they were going to be trespassing into the fields, so they left their car at the head of the road and walked. One of her friends even brought his gun with him, Texas, massive surprise, because he was that worried. They took her to a small ramshackle building a good distance from the road. They told her this was where the rituals took place. Inside, they found some mildly creepy stuff with their flashlights, a doll and a little girl's shoe, but no real proof that it was an occult site. They started to head back to the car, when the friend with the gun, who was at the rear of the group, screams and shoots his gun twice. They all turn around and ask WTF. He was thoroughly shaken up. He said a man appeared next to him but disappeared when he shot at him. None of them believed him, but they got the hell out of there quickly and drove off. After all, they had been trespassing and had made plenty of ruckus. The next time my mom drove home from work along that road, something strange happened. She was driving through the crop fields and swears there were no cars in sight in front of or behind her, and no intersections that a car could turn out of. Yet, she looks in her rearview mirror and all of a sudden, there's a hearse behind her, right on her ass. There had been nothing there moments before. So, she looks around and, out in the fields, there are all these people in hooded robes, just standing there, pointing directly at her as she drives by. She gets out of there and never drove that road again. When I was in college it was the height of all the ghost hunting shows. I was always really interested in the possibly of it all since I was a kid. I didn't know if I believed in it or not, I just liked the idea of investigating it all, so I started doing research. I read books, watched documentaries, and studied different techniques. The more I learned the more I realized that going into a situation looking for ghosts or spirits will completely ruin an investigation. What tends to happen with this mentality is that your brain starts finding things that aren't there, so I started to train myself to go into situations as a skeptic and instead of looking for the paranormal, it was better to look for normal explanations for the abnormal. While doing this I met people from all occupations who also adopted this method. We eventually made a club in our university that actually became the most active and sought after club to be a part of. We were invited to houses, businesses, and historic parks, Gettysburg namely, to see what explanations and evidence we could find. We would hand-pick teams for special investigations if we considered them serious. We did this because the club was open enrollment and while we would take days to have refresher courses of do's and don'ts during investigations there would still be people looking to find ghosts. Anyway, out of all the investigations we did we had three places we went to that we could not explain what we had captured on video and sound. One was a theater in our home city. The entire night we caught nothing and thought it was a bust. Even going through evidence, which we would do three times, provided almost nothing, until a co-investigator's mother walked through the room where we were watching a tape of the entire theater and said, who the hell is up there? We made her show us. In the balcony seats, which were locked that night, and we were not allowed up there because of the antiques in it, there was a lamp lit behind a window curtain. You can see a figure move in front of the light of the lamp to almost block it, 
similarly as if you were to put a white sheet in front of a light to deaden the intensity of it, and then you can see something pull back the curtain a little bit as if it were peeking out. It lasted about 15 seconds. We checked our records of where each group was at the time and asked each person if they'd been on the balcony, all responded no. We then asked our guide, who would unlock and lock the sections we were investigating, to which she responded that she did not have a key to the balcony because of what was inside of them. Regardless, she was with my group at the time of the event and every other person at the investigation was accounted for because we were able to match up timestamps from their recordings. To Gettysburg There were three instances at Gettysburg that were unexplainable. This evidence has been lost because we did this investigation close to seven years ago when we were less organized. The first was a picture, one of the best I've seen. There were actually three pictures that ran together, the first two being just fog that seemed to have a blue hue to it and the last one sending chills down my spine because it was a clear as day man laying on a rock at Devil's Den looking at Little Round Top, from the bottom, dressed in full Confederate garb. When first looking at it looks like the picture was distorted until you realize you can make out the whiskers in his beard and the gold in his patches on his hat and arms of his coat. The second, which I was not there for, was supposedly a piece of paper that was put on a rock in the woods that said, what's your name, they walked back about 40 feet or so and recorded and watched for 30 minutes to make sure it wasn't tampered with. When they went back there were clear scribbles on the paper, but they weren't anything legible. The third and final Gettysburg story is when I was walking through an area between the Wheatfield and Cemetery Ridge. I was with two or three others, and we had about ten feet between us as we walked in line. This is all on a digital recorder. You can hear something hit me in the back, as if someone threw a rock or something. I stopped and said, ouch, Joe, what the hell, dude, to which he says he did nothing. At the time of this we were all stopped and through the recording you can hear us go silent and in the distance hear a drum play a few beats. We did not hear this at the time we stopped until we listened to the recording later, but Joe, as mentioned previously, is a drummer and went white when he heard it, he listened a few more times before telling us it was a halt from a drum line. The third one is very lengthy, and I guess I'll write it if there is any interest. I don't currently do these investigations and I'll be the first one in the room to be a skeptic with any paranormal claim, but there were a few times that I was stumped. I'm not saying I know if ghosts exist or not, I don't have that answer. I can, however, say that there are things in this world we don't understand. Throughout the years we did the club in the university we became universally recognized, have been given awards by the school for what we have done in our investigation tactics and also community and charitable work. Doing investigations are absolutely not what you see on TV, they are much more boring, and you seldom have anything happen, but it's a labor of love. It's hard to explain it, because once you find that one piece of footage you can't explain you want more. I know I'll get backlash from these claims, I always do when I lost my experiences, but I promise on my parents' lives that what I say did indeed happen. I have not tried to emphasize any of it, and I have told the stories as they've happened. I was staying with family friends when I was around 12 years old. Our parents had gone out together for the night. It was myself, my brother who is 9 years old and two sisters 13 and 9 who lived in the house. We were up late watching bad 80s horror videos and eating junk food. At around 1 am the youngest sister made me pause the video so she could go to the toilet. Less than a minute later she came running back into the lounge room looking horrified. She blurts out there is someone trying to get into the toilet window. Being the oldest child in the house I pretend not to be afraid and go into the kitchen and grab a big knife. Then the four of us slowly walked towards the toilet. Thinking if there is someone there they will quickly take off when they see the lights go on and voices in the house. So, I turn all the lights on as I go through the house towards the toilet. I finally get to the toilet and turn the light on and poke my head around the doorway. Sure, enough there are two hands carefully and quietly taking out the Louvre window glass panels one by one. We start yelling and pretending we are in a full house with adults. This doesn't slow him down at all. 
There are about 10 panels and 3 or 4 are now removed. If he gets them all out he could easily just climb straight into the house. At this stage I'm thinking I should maybe slash his hands, but I thought he could get the knife from me. I'm totally scared myself but trying to stay calm and pretending to be in control. The others at this stage are whimpering and crying. I suddenly realize they have a dog in the house that's asleep in front of the fire. It's an old lab but I didn't care. I ran into the lounge and picked up the dog, carried him into the toilet and pointed his face at the window with my hands poking through it. The dog now goes completely nuts barking and growling. The hands stop and I'm hoping they disappear. Thankfully, the guy moves away from the window, and we spend the next couple of hours huddled together in the lounge all with knives in our hands and keeping the dog awake and sending him into the toilet throughout the night. Eventually the parents come home and call the police who come out and fingerprint the outside of the toilet. Never heard anything from the police. Certainly, think it's the most afraid I've ever been. I was driving across the country with my friend, now we were in North Dakota. It had been a long day, lots of driving, at this point it was 1 AM. I just woke up from a nap, my back was killing me. Hey, man, let's call it for the night. My back is killing me let's go to a hotel. Alright, we'll get off at the next exit. So, we're driving, there's nothing around. Absolutely nothing. Eventually we get to the next exit and after a little driving we spot a hotel. There's some road construction going on around it and some of the roads are closed. We try driving up to it, but every intuitive path is fenced off. Now the hotel was more or less right in front of us, to our right there was kind of a dirt slash gravel road that went into a thicket of trees. About 500 yards down this road there is a bright light. This road is the complete opposite direction of the hotel and the main road. Remember there's nothing around but this one hotel and infinite fields and trees. It's also like 1.30 am and completely dark. We kept driving around, unable to get to the hotel when my friend just drove towards the light on the dirt road which is barely wider than the car. I instantly get a bad feeling, this makes no sense. Why is there a light at the end of this dark, dirt road? Dude, what are you doing? This is like bugs flying to a light. Turn around. I will once I find a spot, I don't exactly have the space. Okay, that makes sense, the road was narrow and kind of dropped off on each side. He kept driving closer to the light, which I thought may have been a generator light for construction. Dude, this makes no sense. We get closer and it's a huge flatbed truck with its high beams on, as we realize this we're also blinded by the brightness of them. Oh no, I thought, these people have us where they want us. I'm shielding my eyes, and my friend is driving slowly to pass the behemoth of a truck when the blinding light of the high beams is interrupted by someone walking in front of them and then our car. My friend hits the brake, the figure walks up. My friend rolls the window down a little. It's a well-dressed guy. My friend says, oh hey. We're just trying to get to that hotel over there, but there's all that construction. Oh yeah. That hotel's the greatest, just follow us and we'll take you there. Great. Thanks. The interaction was pleasant enough. My friend rolls up the window and drives past the truck. As he's driving past, the window not all the way up yet, the guy outside calls to another guy, get in the truck. I see some guy from the shadows toss a sig and walk up to the passenger side of the truck. We have to get out of here now. I know man, I'm working on it. At this point, we're doing a 15 point turn on this dark road in the middle of nowhere, literally. We get turned around and the truck is driving slowly and in the middle of the road, intentionally taking up the whole path. I'm bumbling on about how this makes no sense, and we need to escape when all of a sudden the truck slams on its brakes and both guys simultaneously jump out and start running towards us. The guy on my side has a shotgun. My friend didn't miss a beat and just floored it, and we went flying off the little drop-off on the side of the road. 
We sped all the way back to the road. Got back on the highway, made sure we weren't followed and went to the next town. Sleep was not that good that night. Thing is, around year 1999 to 2000 I was now living in the same house with my mom and sister, we used to hang around the main room watching movies and most of the time fell asleep on Sundays. One day, whilst we were sleeping the phone rings and I pick up the call was very noisy but there was a woman on the other side, and they called me by my name she said, open the window, I answered, who is this, she replied, open the window, I asked again, why? Who is this? Then she said, I'm your grandma, open the window, and then hung up. After that, and still startled, thinking it must have been the wrong number I started walking back to the room and walked past the kitchen and I suddenly felt the smell of gas leaking. I hurried up to open the windows and then woke my mum up and told her, she said that was the first time she had seen me truly scared. I still don't know what truly happened, it might have been a wrong number but the chances of what happened were just very odd. It was in the winter of 2007, and my friends and I would get together every Tuesday to go to Buffalo Wild Wings for their specials. I drove a van at the time, so, of course, it was my job to shuttle everyone around. I had just picked up my friend and was pulling out of his driveway when I noticed someone standing in the middle of the street at the end of his road. It was already dark out, but there was a streetlight over top of him. I figured at first it was someone out for an evening walk, but as we start to get closer, we notice that the person is just standing there, staring blankly down the road in our direction. I slowed down as I was pulling up next to him and noticed that it was an old man dressed in all white. I stopped next to him at the stop sign, and we were about to roll down the window to ask if he needed help, when he slowly turned and began walking towards my van without saying a word and still just blankly staring. At this point I sped off, my friend and I both screaming. As I was driving away, I looked in my mirror, and the old man was still just walking slowly after my van. A few weeks later, a different friend, one not part of the Buffalo Wild Wings group and not likely to hear my story, was telling me about the weird car ride he had had the night before. As he was driving home from class one night, he almost ran into an old man in white standing in the middle of the road. That was the last anyone I know of has seen, the man in white, but I still get freaked out driving around my neighborhood at night. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like, share and subscribe. The Internet Surfer on YouTube for more horror and scary stories.